Welcome everyone to the fourth episode of the Tech Radar podcast, where I'm joined once again by Matt Evans, hello, Amy Schechter, hello, and Lance Ulanoff once again joining us from New York. Hello. Uh, we're back for another episode filled with the latest tech news and everything that's been happening in the last month, from Samsung's unpacked event to the Microsoft outage. We'll also be talking a little bit about the DJI drone situation and about what we've all been buying for Prime Day. But before we get too much into that, I'm going to pass over to Hamish Hector to give us in on everything we've missed this month. Thanks, Josie. Yes, if you somehow missed it, there was a huge global outage which affected an estimated 8.5 million Windows machines across sectors including travel, health and finance, all due to a third party security software update. In other news, Samsung's unpacked event showcased new foldable phones earbuds, two Galaxy smartwatches, and the hotly anticipated Galaxy Ring. CMF by Nothing also had a product launch, though its more budget-friendly tech took customization to the extreme with swappable phone backs and 3D printer files so you can make your own accessories. DJI drones took another step towards getting banned after the United States House of Representatives passed the Countering CCP Drones Act. Perhaps that's why DJI is expanding its project range into something completely different, e-bikes. Last but not least, we also saw Amazon's annual Prime Day event, with many of our favorite gadgets getting big discounts at not only Amazon, but other retailers trying to get in on the sales hype. Thanks, Hamish. Another very busy month, especially with Prime Day for all of us. Did anyone get any good deals? I did. What did you get? I had, well, I, I I was forced into it. I lost my uh, Kindle, my beloved Kindle, on an airplane back uh, out to Paris. I just left it. And uh, so I had to buy a new one. And I did get, it was only like 10% off, which is not a great deal, but I was desperate. So I bought it. Which one did you get? It's the Kindle Paperwhite, which is the 6.8 inch device. So I could have paid less. I could have gotten one for like under $100, which is the basic Kindle, but it's not as bright. It's not as big a screen. The screen isn't flat. Uh, it, it, it doesn't have wireless charging. So, you know, there's, there's things about it that I, I just thought it was time to, uh, to upgrade to something nicer. Fair enough. Yeah. <laughs> I feel your pain. I'm on my fourth Kindle in about 10 years, which is a very bad batting average. <laughs> <laughs> is that from losing them, breaking them? Yeah, little column That's A, little column B. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. How do you break a Kindle? Just angry reading. You take out your bag and it's been loose and then suddenly the screen doesn't work. Okay, um, that's, yeah. that's yeah. Mm, mm, controversial. Mm. What, what about yourself, Hamish? Uh, yeah, mine's a little embarrassing. I was <laughs> nearly going to buy some uh, Magic the Gathering cards, saw some deals convincing me, but thought, no, no, I've got too many. Uh, so instead, I bought the one thing I did need, which was a new toilet seat. Wow. Nice. You really that's my up. prime day purchase. That's Very right. nice. Yep. I got a that's Fire beautiful. TV because uh, I haven't had a f properly functioning TV for about seven years. Um, it's a long time to go without a TV. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's I just had this really, really rubbish one from when I was a student. In fact, not even when I was a student, when I was just out of university. And I just thought to myself, it, it still shows things on the screen. It's fine. And then proceeded to not use it at all for four years because the screen and the audio were so painful. Um, I think it's also worth picking up on that DJI topic a little bit briefly that you just mentioned. Uh, it's a really interesting story to sort of understand where we're going with some of the privacy law things, where things are going with, how different countries relate to each other with uh, technology. Lance, uh, obviously this is a very US-based story. You've covered it a fair amount as well. How likely do you think we are to see this DJI ban come through and what do you think might be the, the follow-up from that? You know, it's kind of interesting because in the U.S., obviously, we're in a uh, presidential election season and and also, you know, a lot of members of the, the House and Senate might change. And so that could impact uh, some of these rules, you know, similar to what we're looking at with DJI. Obviously, it's any company uh, that is coming out of China making technology that we all might touch. So like TikTok is, is, is on the bubble, too. They're supposed to be sold uh, before the end of this year, and that's stuck in courts right now. DJI may follow a similar path if they get actually banned in the U.S. They may go into court to fight it, um, although they could not fight on free speech grounds as TikTok is trying to do. Uh, so I, I really don't know. I mean, but I will say that, you know, DJI has built the consumer and prosumer uh, drone market. There are, there are no, in my opinion, and I've used a lot of DJI drones and I've used other drones, there are no better drones than the DJI drones. Um, and I, I'm not thrilled about this. I'm not thrilled that they're going after them. I get it. 
I get that we're in an adversarial relationship now with China, although I think it's more of an adversarial relationship with Russia, and that's why Kaspersky was kicked out as well. Mm. Um, but, you know, I just don't, I just think this is wrongheaded. You know, consumers want these things. You know, we're not running around spying on each other with them. And if they are, they're quickly removed from the skies. You have to register them at a certain size. So I just think it's a shame. I really don't know what's going to happen though, because I will, I will say one thing about uh, the U.S. these days. All it does is surprise me. I think I know what's going to happen, but I don't. So I wish I could tell you more. Well, and speaking of surprises, there was then DJI's subsequent uh, announcement about breaking into the e-bike space. Yeah, e-bikes. Bizarre. Matt, have you sort of covered a little bit about e-bikes before? What's your take on that? Do you think it's strategic or was it always happening? So it sounds odd at first glance, drones and e-bikes. But when you look at what goes into creating a drone, which is a combination of batteries, propulsion and motors, and you look at what goes into creating an e-bike, which is rechargeable batteries, propulsions and motors. So Mm. it does kind of make a lot of sense. Um, They're creating an EMTB, an electric mountain bike, and it's going to be on the more pricey end, uh, around $7,000, I think, based on the news story we ran. However, the our leading EMTB on our best electric bike buying guide, which is in no way a plug, um, (laughs) is the specialized uh, SL Expert Carbon, which is also getting up to around that price range. So it's not an unheard of uh, price point. I think it's going to do really well. I haven't seen it myself. I don't think anybody has at this point, but let's wait and see. I think it's going to be a good one to uh, tear up around the trails for um, one lucky reviewer. Yeah, no, it's an interesting an interesting thing where they're coming in with such a known name, but not really by its target audience. Uh, you know, the people who buy e-bike, I mean, actually, in fairness, action, action cam wearers, people who do lots of sports, I suppose. Yeah, if you don't get banned, you have the drone following you behind on your mountain bike trek. That's really interesting, like actually. An action mm. shot flying around. I wonder or, if this will be the new smart ring to, to smart yeah. watch companion uh, mm. pair in, in tech. Or if you're getting up into a summit, perhaps you are then launching the drone and getting the best camera angles, the best kind of like bird's eye view of proceedings. Who knows? I mean, the drones all can follow you really well, but just keep in mind that uh, these e-bikes will probably have some GPS capabilities and some U.S. lawmakers might say, oh, well, so they can track and know where you've been. So let's ban those too. Yeah, that's uh, it's an interesting outlook for DJI. We'll have to see how things pan out, but uh, yeah. wouldn't be in a rush to buy any DJI devices this year. I think <laughs> the, the ban's going to be retrospective as well, isn't it, to older devices, not just new ones. So maybe hold on. They will take mine out of my cold, dead fingers. <laughs> <laughs> um, now, we should definitely move on to talk about Samsung Galaxy Unpacked event. All of the new tech we saw there, both software and hardware, some really exciting news from them. Um, for everyone, though, first, what were your highlights? Uh, Lance, you were out there, so perhaps let's start with you. Uh, so obviously, it, you know, it was in Paris, great location, uh, you know, the opportunity to, uh, I literally unboxed products outside the Louvre, you know, so in this really iconic place with the, the, the pyramid, the glass pyramid right there, uh, somehow nobody bothered me. <laughs> uh, I, I was taking pictures of these new products in this location, so that was a lot of fun. Uh, And then, you know, I think generally, while they've done a bunch of things and they've introduced new, you know, including the new Galaxy Ring, I think that this felt like the true coming out party for Galaxy AI. I think seeing it on these devices, in particular, the Fold, uh, the Z Fold 6 that I've been reviewing, I think that's been uh, somewhat transformative because uh, it's real. uh, You can use it right now. It's not coming soon. uh, It works at all different levels. It's not always useful often fun, but some of it is truly useful. Um, I even was using it in meetings uh, that I went to for the event. I was transcribing things in notes and letting it summarize for me. So um, I think that for me ultimately was the most exciting thing. Matt, probably for you, I imagine it's going to be the ring, right? You've been talking about this for months. Yes, it's mostly the ring with a little side piece for the Galaxy Watch Ultra. And Mm -hmm. I am wearing both today. So where's my camera? Um, The (laughs) Samsung Galaxy Ring and the Galaxy Watch Ultra. um, I've had a chance to test them over a weekend. And I've uh, got some initial thoughts, but um, especially the Galaxy Ring, I'm really, really impressed with. 
Well, we'll be mm. doing a full video review of both of those, so make sure to subscribe to keep an eye out for that soon. Hamish, what about yourself? Oh, I think it'd have to be that really, really awkward Sydney Sweeney moment. I was going to say the same thing. <laughs> I'm so glad we were so focused on work-related <laughs> subjects the whole time. Um, no, I think actually it's like... There wasn't actually a product announcement for this, but sort of Google and Samsung confirming that they're sort of XR, which is sort of like a catch-all for like mm -hmm. VR and AR and mixed reality. That they're doing something and it's coming this year. Mm -hmm. They're very like still not really saying exactly what it is. They've just called it a platform, which could be software, hardware, mix of both. Uh, but yeah, obviously I love XR. I want to see what they do in response sort of. Obviously, we've got the Apple Vision Pro on one end. We've got the MetaQuest 3 on the other end in terms of price. Where Where's the Samsung, Google product going to land? Somewhere in the middle, maybe maybe a Vision Pro competitor. We'll have to see. We also surveyed our YouTube uh, subscribers, and they said that the favorite things they had from the show in order were the Watch Ultra, then the ring, then the flip, then the fold. So we're going to take that as our structure, but reverse it and start by talking about the flip <laughs> and fold. Um, so let's talk about those first. Hamish, you've got yes. them here. With these, we're going to have a little bit of a talk about what we think about foldables moving forwards. Now, there's been lots of discussion for years about foldables. There's still the like continuing issue of the crease. People really don't like creases. Um, but there are also lots of people who really believe in foldable phones and really believe in this technology moving forward. So we'll do a quick rip round first, and I'm going to sort of dig into everyone's opinion. So, Matt, foldable fan or no? Yeah, I love the idea, but it's still got a little ways to go. Last time, I think last time I was coming down for this podcast, I uh, was on a train and somebody tried to get their train ticket scanned, but the QR code was sat just on the crease and they couldn't scan it. That's brutal. So mm. it's really oh difficult. Um, so and there are a few kinks still to be worked out, but I mean, I, I had uh, an OG Samsung flip phone, the X40 or something. It had nice. that little plastic aerial. Um, so it was, I'm of the era where I see a Z flip and I'm like, oh, it, it reminds me of being like 14 mm -hmm. again. Yeah. So, yeah. They are I'm, very sweet. And Hamish, let's go with you next. What's your... I I get the fold, the, the book one, which opens up to be a tablet. I okay. cannot understand why the flip is popular. See, that's so interesting I to just, me. It, it doesn't make a lot of sense to me. And I think... I think Lance might be able to correct me if this is wrong, but I, I believe the flip models are more popular than the fold models. So I don't... That's true. And I just... It makes no sense. So, uh, uh, yep, it, you're wrong. We're gonna if you come prefer this, you're wrong. <laughs> We're going to come back to this. We're going to educate the children. Um, but Lance, let's start off with you. Uh, let's finish off with you. What's your take on foldables? Um, I, I like them. I like them. I like that they're dual purpose devices. Yes, the flip, you know, I have here does remind me of when I was 40 again. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, you know, it, I think it's, it's, you know, people get excited about these because the design, it's small. Um, it appeals to, I think it appeals to Gen Z. Um, and certainly, you know, you mentioned Sydney Sweeney. The, the, the device that she's most seen carrying around is the flip, not the fold. Uh, and she's been doing that for like a year. She's paid to do it, but she could have been, you know, carrying around the fold. But I think that that's, that's for more serious people. But I, generally, I'm pro foldable phone. One of my favorite comments I, I saw in the, the run up to this podcast episode was uh, the play on the classic Mean Girls line of like, stop trying to make foldables happen. They're not going to happen. <laughs> uh, I think that conversation is an interesting sort of reflection of that, right? Well, just uh, what are your opinions on foldables? So I've been using iPhones since I was 11, 12, and I am bored. I am so bored of iPhones. I love Apple. I love everything about their ecosystem. But I hate how big they are. I have quite dainty hands. And the bigger the phones get, the less I enjoy using them. I quite like foldables because they just give me the option to have something a little bit more petite for my hands and a little bit easier in girly pockets. That's a term I'm going to coin, girl pockets, uh, because they're always tiny pockets and they're always skin tight. And it's just not fun having an iPhone in them. So I am actually coming around to the idea of a foldable. If iPhone, if Apple, sorry, did a foldable iPhone that was a flip, I would be all over it. But tablet-based ones, I don't get them at all. I don't get them at all. How do you hold them? They're way too big. Well, okay, let's get into this. <laughs> no, they're massive. Okay, no, let's get into this, okay? 
I've also for I've brought along an S24 for comparison. So they're about sort of the same height. Show the people on the couch. Yeah. And uh, this makes sense to me because you've got a phone and you go, oh, I need a slightly bigger screen for something. And you just open it up. You hold it two handed. You type type your password in so you can actually get to it. And then you've got everything you need. And it, it, you have, a, I found it's quite fun. You I haven't actually used too many folding phones. But when you have a, uh, the, the, keyboard comes up, it sort of comes up on each side of the screen, sort of split down the middle, so it's a little bit easier to type. But I don't this, hate that. This makes sense, because you've actually got like an, a tablet that you can then fold up and put in your pocket. This is just this, but longer. <laughs> well, and it's inconvenient, because my hands are all the way down here, and the icon I want is all the way up here. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to sort of reach up, and I'm going to move my hand around, and it's... Valid. It, it's, so it's just this but more inconvenient. <laughs> and yeah, okay, it's got a screen on the backside, but it's small and it doesn't do much. It did. It does translation now, right, with the new AI tools, which I guess is sort of useful so you can be looking at, so I would say something in English and then speak to someone, say, in Spanish, and it would show me what they're saying back in English and it would show them what I'm saying in Spanish. Which is which great. Which is useful, yeah. so I'm not having to, like, flip my phone around all the time. But again... That that's like one niche use case. I just I just don't get why this is what people want. <laughs> I, I maybe on the girl pockets thing, I will concede that is actually a a convenience because guy pockets I can just sort of shove like a meter ruler down there Your and it will go all the way. Yeah, very lucky. <laughs> uh, so maybe I will concede that that's 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 an argument, but it uh, may. Maybe it's also a nostalgia thing because I, I had a flip phone oh, definitely. very yeah. briefly for like two months. It was my mum's old one. I had it because I was taking the bus to school and she wanted to make sure I was safe. And then that was it. I was on to like a, I think I had a very early touch phone after that point. Yeah, we, we should keep in mind that, you know, foldable phones in general are like 3% of the market total. I mean, like people don't have bikers. They're very expensive, right? Yeah. And if you go to South Korea and you run around, you may see a mix of the fold and the flip, but you will probably see more flips. Uh, you know, cute culture in South Korea is very big. This is, you know, the flip is an extremely adorable phone. Um, it's heavier than any foldable I owned, you know, back, you know, 20 years ago, but it's still, it's super cute and it's got a lot of different performance. The one other thing I'll say about the fold um, which I understand might seem like really big compared to a standard uh, smartphone, flagship smartphone, but it is only nine grams heavier than the Samsung Galaxy S24 Ultra. Now it is probably twice as thick when folded. Mm -hmm. It's you know almost twice as thick as sort of a, an iPhone 15 Pro Max as well, but not significantly heavier. By, by any stretch. And if you unfold it, of course, it's much thinner. So um, I no longer feel like if I'm carrying it around, I'm carrying around this big boxy thing. I'm hearing what we really need is a foldable that folds twice. <laughs> <laughs> An old <Arnie> phone, <laughs> yeah. basically. There you go. Quad, quad fold, tri-fold, dual fold. Wasn't, wasn't there some sort of concept phone at CES that had like a multiple folding? And this was the was uh, the bendable phone the that bendable you can wear phone. around your oh, wrist. Or that was it. Flex, oh, that was terrible. You know. Yeah, that's, that, that <laughs> that's is terrible. terrible. I think we can all agree on that one at the very least. Yeah. Like yeah. a slap band? Yeah, it was yeah. just like that. It was like the world's biggest smartwatch you know what? because it wrapped right around. I would buy that. <laughs> oh, cool. Right. I would buy that. Samsung, make a slap phone and I will buy it. <laughs> <laughs> not, not just the bendable one in general it has to have the slapping motion I have to be able to smack it to my arm and it wraps around <laughs> nearly break your wrist every yeah. single time um, yeah, so. it'll, it'll, it'll last a week but <laughs> right, I'll buy it it'll it's have good a... to know that there's the bar <laughs> <laughs> yeah. give me a ridiculous uh, useless function mm. and I will buy your very expensive useless phones useless or cool <laughs> yeah. Fair, fair. <laughs> well, let us know in the comments what your opinion is on the foldable phone trend that's happening. Um, but next, we're definitely going to talk a bit more about wearables. So this yes. is all on you, Matt. So obviously, lots of big wearables news. We had the long-awaited and already sold out Samsung Galaxy Ring uh, and also the Watch Ultra. Um, now, one of the biggest conversation points has been around the similarities between the Aura Ring and the Galaxy Ring, especially now we've seen it in full. Yes. We know about this lawsuit that we talked about in the last episode. 
Could you talk a little bit about what the differences are just to help people understand? Yeah. So they are fundamentally very, very similar with very, very similar sensors. And I think if you, um, in our hands-on, I brought an aura ring to Samsung HQ, which may have been frowned upon. I don't know. Nobody told me otherwise. <laughs> and Politically I incorrect. <laughs> took photos of them side by side and from the top down. From the top down, they look virtually identical, even right down to the bumps inside the ring. And I really? doubt uh, it for skin for improved skin contact. But um, there's uh, but otherwise, they are very very similar devices in terms of the sensors they carry and the design. There are some differences in terms of design. For example, something I did talk about in the review was that Samsung have chosen a concave mm -hmm. design, which uh, curves slightly inwards, leaving the two edges exposed in order to stop the surface of the ring getting scratched as much. Okay. Aura have chosen a traditional wedding band style convex design. Mm -hmm. So considerations have been made and it feels like Samsung has learned from the design of the Aura ring and other smart rings before it, like Rincon and Ultra Human. Um, when it comes to features, Samsung uh, can pretty accurately, judging by the last weekend that I've been wearing the ring, estimate uh, blood oxygen, HRV, uh, sleep quality, uh, sleep wake times, uh, movement, steps, although I've been wearing the Watch Ultra as well, so the uh, those metrics have been synchronized and are working together. So I don't know entirely how the ring functions on its own without a Galaxy Watch. The Aura Ring has a few extra features, like an AI personal sort of assistant and uh, the ability to create a timeline of your day, which you can put tags, like if you're... Uh, core temperature has shot up, you can add a tag to your timeline to say hot shower or something like that to say, oh, okay, this would be why. Whereas if you put a tag saying I had a nap and your temperature shot up, then it means, oh, okay, maybe you're coming down with something. Um, Mine would just be, you know, a spike of uh, temperature, had a phone call, got yeah. stressed. <laughs> a spike of adrenaline. <laughs> like, yeah, yeah sp spike of adrenaline, left my house. <laughs> yeah. so, Sorry, continue. No, it's absolutely fine. Um, but Samsung doesn't have that feature. It does have some Galaxy AI uh, wellness personal assistant stuff, um, especially if you've been wearing it for up to seven days. It has the Galaxy Watch's uh, sleep animal feature, which assigns you a chronotype, which tells you, uh, your sleep habits and things like that and it's represented by a cute little animal figure um, and it does have some of these it does share a lot of similarities with Aura and other smart rings like it but there are some differences Fair enough and what what's the sort of difference when it comes to things one of the biggest questions we got was around privacy and also around uh, what device compatibility it has so perhaps on the privacy front first what's the difference that we know so far? Very very similar in terms of I've had conversations with um, Aura's CEO Tom Hale about this and I raised the question of privacy and a lot of things are done on device and in terms of your health metrics anything they do learn from is effectively anonymized so say Samsung's more or less the same it's been doing this for many many years and it's been handling health data for many many years with the Samsung Galaxy Watch so it knows what it's doing at this point um, and there's not been as far as I can see any changes to their privacy policy with the advent of the Galaxy ring and with the the ring and the watch working together yes is that necessary or can you go without it's not necessary at all and it's not even necessary to wear this with a samsung phone i've been using an oppo android phone and i've downloaded samsung health from the uh, google play store and it works absolutely fine and i've not found any barriers so far all you really need is samsung health so you still need to be embedded in the samsung ecosystem but you don't necessarily need an s24 a flip a fold anything like that in order to get the in order to get the most out of it it won't work with an iphone no yeah that's the only <laughs> caveat really you with device compatibility Android, yeah, yeah. Well, that's me off the, yeah. the, the, the potential buyers list for now. We'll see. I'm still still thinking about that flip, still thinking about it. Um, now, obviously, we've seen all of the devices in Samsung's lineup now, in the wearables lineup. We've seen 10 years of Apple smartwatches and lots of other smartwatches on the market. Yeah. Uh, one of the biggest comments we got 
throughout all of the coverage we've done uh, on wearables in general has been how a lot of these devices are looking pretty samey. Uh, one of the comments we had on TikTok was from someone saying that the Samsung Galaxy Watch Ultra looks an awful lot like the Apple Watch Ultra. <laughs> um, we've seen this in phones. We've seen this in now earbuds. We've seen this in lots of places. Um, but with wearables, you would think it's going to be a little bit different, right? They're a wearable device. They're a fashion device by nature, yet they've sort of got this homogenous look. Matt, I know you've got some feelings on yes. wearables being the same. So when this was announced, I'm going to take this off so you can better see it better. Um, the Samsung Galaxy Ultra, it shares the uh, classic Samsung Galaxy circular screen, but they've mounted it on the squircle style, what they're calling a cushion, which is uh, aluminium. They've added a quick button, which is very similar to the Apple Watch Ultra's action button. And uh, they've sort of, you know, they've gone for that rugged aesthetic, um, all that, like, you know, it, it's very similar to the Apple Watch Ultra in a lot of respects design-wise. Um, and... I feel like this was an opportunity for Samsung to do something a little bit different or build on the Samsung Galaxy Watch 5 Pro, mm. which was another adventure style watch that built on Samsung's initial Galaxy Watch design. But instead, they saw the how well the Apple Watch Ultra was doing and said, "Yes, please, we want some of that." <laughs> um, and it's you know, and it's it's kind of boring. And I wish they'd gone a bit. You know, they'd done something different with it. I wish they'd got, like, you know, done, been experimental, been a bit bolder. When Apple came out with the Apple Watch Ultra, it was, you know, it looks very similar to the uh, the standard Apple Watch, but mm. it has enough of its own design ethos that it was the most the most radical change Apple had done to its wearables in years. Um, and weirdly, the, the company who's doing a lot more of this is Huawei, which we don't hear talked about very often. Yeah. They did watches with earbuds hidden in the casing and they did uh, a watch with a blood pressure cuff the huawei watch d which allowed you to take blood pressure by swelling the watch band that acted like a blood pressure cuff oh, that's and bizarre. it was weird <laughs> and it was fun but every time i showed somebody people went wow and it was like back in the sort of you know early late 2000s when smart tech was just coming out and people were trying loads of different things like the nokia n-gauge and it was getting weird and, yeah. it might, and i miss weird bold inventive designs and everything looks the same now yeah you, you know matt i was just gonna say that that it's funny i've been wearing the the samsung galaxy watch ultra now for a few days um and i've gotten a lot of comments on it and it is very big and it's very heavy um and really bold looking but I have not worn the Apple Watch Ultra just for some reason. I never tried, never ended up reviewing it, never wore it. So for me, this watch is kind of new and different. Um, it's extremely big and bold. Uh, it has its own theoretical look and feel, but I understand how similar when you take a look at the Ultra, it might look. But taken on its own, I think it's not a bad. It, it, it's not a bad attempt at, at creating something that has that sort of, you know, ruggedness and do it all uh, ethos. Uh, but I, I, I get your point about, you know, people not taking risks, going far enough. But, you know, my recollection of the, the Huawei watch, that D watch, is that it was cool, but completely impractical. Yeah, I would say the same. It's fairly impractical and it felt like a first generation device that never really got off the ground. Um, I would be very interested to see another company take a crack at it or Huawei to take a second crack at it and see mm. if it's something that could be built in and look a little bit sleeker. I seem to remember the Watch D, the casing itself looking pretty, pretty boxy and pretty ugly. Um, yeah. And I would love to see, and perhaps, as I said, you know, that, that idea come to fruition and be incorporated in part of a slimmer, sleeker, more overall well-rounded design i think otherwise like you know advertising it as this watch can do your blood pressure cuff and that is kind of the only distinguishing feature for it means the only people that are going to buy it are people who want to take their blood pressure at regular intervals which aren't the majority <laughs> of smartwatch users yeah i i just want to get to that phase that you know in the 90s when people were sort of first conceiving of these sort of wearable tech things i think it was was it kim possible had like a smartwatch that yes. had like a screen that popped out of it and you got like a satellite <laughs> spinning around like that's what i want i want like a full utility belt but in a watch that's what i'm looking for like a buzz light ear like a, hell yeah, yeah absolutely because yeah. also then on the other end of like all this sort of 
homogenization, you've got nothing, who with their like new CMF brand, Phone One, you can take the back off and you can yes. swap it in for all these different attachments. And then, yeah, they released 3D printer files. So you've got all the specs exactly of these phone backs. So if you've got a 3D printer at home and you've got an idea for some attachment that you want to make for this what uh, this smartphone, you can bung it on and print it yourself. And I think that that's, that's an interesting idea, but also it's sort of, you wonder like how many people are actually going to do that? How many people are going to want to do that? Is it just sort of this gimmick that we're going to talk about on a podcast and a news article that it get a bit gets a bit hyped, right? I can sort of see you nodding your headlines. That, well, that's it. I mean, basically, look, the, the history of products is everything will ultimately slide down toward the middle, right? Mm. I, I always envision a trough, right? Like, a, you know, you have the edge cases on, on left and right where it's like sort of high difference, unusual, and they're way up there. And then slowly but surely, everything slides down, slides down, slides down. It all meets down in the middle. But that has a lot to do with customer interest, right? Consumers buy things that do the job that they needed to do and with minimal friction, right? They don't want any issues. They don't want to have to figure things out. They don't want to have to print something. They don't want to have to switch backs. They wanted to have all the features that they want. Mm. That's why the iPhone was so successful. That's why, you know, we went from the iPod to the iPhone, which further incorporated these features. Why does everything look alike? Because basically you're just looking for things to work. You're not looking for, um, you know, like it's like a car, right? Every 99% of cars have four wheels, four doors, and then, you know, the, the, and then they kind of worked around the edges on the design differences. And major, the major functionality was all the same. And they all had the same sort of, fu- sort of look and feel ultimately. Uh, they just try and have different looking designs. And that's ultimately what you get with these devices that they kind of have to sort of work around the edges on, on design flourishes. Until you get to a completely new form factor, like a foldable, where you have to do something different. So, I, I mean, I have no interest in a phone where I have to bolt on parts. Zero, <laughs> absolutely zero interest. I mean, I quite like it for the thing of like, for example, pop sockets uh, were super, super popular a few years ago as an easier way to hold your phone. I still, well, I don't actually have one on now, but I am a big proponent of the pop sockets because my little dainty wrists cannot handle the weight and size of these ginormous phones. Um, The idea of being able to make a custom fit pop socket that just goes as part of the case that I've designed myself, I like, but I don't have a 3D printer. I don't have the time to make up any schematics if I'd need to do that. And I am not very good at using computer software to do that. Like I've tried Blender, it did not work very well for me. So you can see where they're going, but it's not a glowing indictment. I think give it another five, 10 years, we'll start seeing a lot more inventiveness coming out of things like earbuds and, and watches again, just like we're seeing with phones now. But it is a question of if people care as much as we do, which is invariably not always yes. <laughs> I think, yeah, Lance made a fair point of he's not used the Apple Watch, uh, Apple Watch Ultra. Yes. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's so hard to remember what the like little suffix they add on the end <laughs> is, isn't it? But yeah, hasn't used it. So then using this new Galaxy Watch, it feels very new. And I think mm. that's obviously something we need to remember is if we're using all this stuff all the time, it feels very samey. Yeah. But for someone that's not getting a new watch or a new phone every other month, it feels very new and different. Absolutely. Yeah, that's very true. Yeah. Um, now, we also wanted to make some time to talk about this Microsoft outage. It was probably the biggest news of, what well, you say, it's a big yay there. Yeah. <laughs> the world comes to a stop and Hamish is like, oh, yes. Anarchy, no. <laughs> uh, it's probably the biggest news we've seen in a little while in terms of things like outages. Uh, Lance, you did a lot of talking about this last week. Could you just give a quick rundown for anyone who somehow missed the news, probably because it wasn't running due to the outage? <laughs> Uh, right. <laughs> yeah. If you, if you were stuck in an airport, this is why. <laughs> um, so, so really, um, it's more accurately called a crowd strike outage. I yes. mean, I look, I get that, um, it caused the failure of possibly millions of Windows systems across, you know, IT around the world, but it was literally sparked by this company, CrowdStrike, which is a cybersecurity firm that delivers regular security updates, so sort of at an enterprise level, to customers around the world. Somehow, they delivered a bad bit of code. It's still not entirely clear. Like, was it just like a, what's called a signature file update, which would be like, here's your latest threats, here's how to block them, or was it something a little bit deeper? In any case, it went in. It went in, uh, I think it was uh, late, uh, what it be, Friday 
overnight Friday, Thursday into Friday. And uh, basically um, systems blue screened all over the place and major systems in airports, 911 systems, uh, TV networks, healthcare, uh, and you know, anything that sort of runs on a Windows host or a Windows system uh, seemed to just go, people saw blue screens at airports and fl flights were grounded. And by the way, to this day, they are still struggling. You, know, it, you If you're listening to this, you know, at the be you know, the third week in July, well, things were still bad a week later. Uh, and uh, it was, it was really insane. And uh, now the question is, and and I've been asked this many times, how do we make sure this doesn't happen again? You know, keep in mind that one of the reasons this was so, this went so far and wide is that CrowdStrike is used by so many people. It's like a sole provider. And so then can you diversify this so this doesn't happen again? Why did the companies on the other side not sandbox the software that was coming in so they would double check it before it was installed? Like there are all these questions. And then by the way, who's going to pay? for the outage and what it's cost people um, all around the world. So a lot of mop up to do, uh, big wake up call for people. And the one last thing I'll say, because I wrote about this and, and talked about it is that, you know, 24 years ago, we had these fears about what's called Y2K. It was a switch over from 1999 to 2000, which apparently computer systems around the world weren't prepared to handle. And people really thought we were going to be plunged into darkness. Like it was, you know, full on people stockpiling bunkers, all of that did not happen. Barely a blip. Um, this was, we call this Y2K24, right? This was it. This was the first blush of what could really happen in a situation like that. And it's super interesting. It's saying about, you know, this is the first time it happened. I actually saw on Reddit, there was a very, very similar, fairly wide scale uh, blue screen of death disruption a couple of weeks before. I'm not entirely convinced it was also by CrowdStrike, but uh, it was much smaller, obviously, than what actually happened on Friday. But it was widespread enough and could have gone big even then. So this is the beginnings of, you know, these large scale service providers being used globally starting to have to take accountability really for what happens if things go down and um, I, I was in Amsterdam when it happened uh, visiting my partner at the end of a business trip and a bunch of his colleagues were all going home on the Friday or were supposed to be and ended up grounded <laughs> in Amsterdam not a bad place to be stuck for a few days um, but not necessarily loving that they only had their work suits with them from a week at a conference did anyone else get personally affected by it on Friday? Not personally, no, but we were covering it in the office and mm -hmm. I was uh, r contributing to the live blog by looking at a few healthcare stories around the world. Um, I shared a short Twitter conversation with somebody who was a 911 services service, 911 service operator. Mm. Um, and uh, something- In Alaska, it went completely down. Yeah, something she said, I don't know exactly where yes. she was based, but she was talking about hos hospitals were on paper and radio traffic which is, and yeah. they were being run basically assigned where these 911 calls were going, whereas previously they would have the freedom to choose. It sounded like absolute chaos out there. Yeah, in, in New Delhi airport, they were doing boarding passes mm. on on pen and paper, uh, which is, I've, I've never seen that in my lifetime. I think printers have been fairly standard practice in airports for a while now. Uh, what about yourselves, Lance, Hamish, did you get affected at all by anything? Um well, one thing, a friend of ours uh, was supposed to fly home from Florida. Flight was canceled. They're now driving 18 hours. Mm. Uh, and the second thing is, you know, terribly important to me is that uh, my Kindle did not arrive on time. Oh, that is bad. <laughs> it was, it was, you know, a, a, and I was very upset because I couldn't read over the weekend. <laughs> but, um, but it really was, it d did say in the Amazon message that it was a, just the, due to the disruption. And basically, you know, when you're a prime customer, you're guaranteed two days free shipping. Well, that was not the case. They were just all backed up. Um, systems were, were trying to recover. Uh, but good news is I have my Kindle now. That was my next okay. question because it is obviously the most important takeaway from this. Uh, I'm glad you <laughs> have it. Um, yeah, there were, there are a few people who are out in, in Amsterdam that my partner works with who got, uh, you know, drove to Brussels and then got a Eurostar and then drove back up to London. Like it, it was absolute pandemonium. Yeah. Um, doesn't sound fun. No, no, not great. It was a rude awakening as well. I think, you know, our colleague Christian wrote an article, much like what Lance was saying there about, you know, this is fine. We managed to come back from it. It is going to cause disruptions. There are going to be problems for weeks, but it's fine enough what happens 
if it's not fine. And, you know, people were making light of the situation. We've done it ourselves here. But the likes of Kapersky were making fun on Twitter and people were not responding well to it because they were scared. Um, what do you all think? Do we think this is just a one-time thing that we were unfortunate enough to see happen? Or is this the start of a trend that we can expect more outages, more problems that might affect people? I don't I think I don't know if it's the start of a trend, but I think we'll probably see more outages. I think one thing I've seen a lot of people talking about online is I I don't know if this was the case with um with uh CrowdStrike specifically, Mm. but in general, um as businesses are looking to integrate things like AI and these new technologies into testing their code and their developments, they're looking at scrapping and downsizing their QA teams, the quality assurance team that would be the people that would double check, hey, is this code going to cause massive outages? And um, and obviously now there's a talk of maybe we shouldn't be downsizing our QA teams and maybe we shouldn't be relying on AI because, hey, like maybe so even if humans made an error this time, maybe an artificial intelligence will make the same mistake. And yeah, as we've got these big brands that, you know, like CrowdStrike, I think it's way more popular than the next most popular security system, or it was. Don't mm. know if that'll be the case now. <laughs> According um, to the stock market, very much no. no. <laughs> so it's sort of, it, you know, whether it maybe other brands are going to, it's going to spread the load a little bit and maybe that'll, that'll happen as well. But yeah, I think it's this this big look at how do we make sure that we protect ourselves and maybe don't over rely on downsizing to rush out a product that then really messes everything up. Yeah, I, I, I agree with that. And I think that, uh, that downsizing is a really, you know, not enough resources, human resources in these places, in these critical systems, because, you know, one thing that is very clear to me is that our infrastructure around the world uh, is run on systems of various ages. Uh, most of them are dealing with cloud-based services. Uh, and there is a fair amount of hands-off automation. And I think that people need, you know, yes, AI could help you, but honestly, for systems like this, for our water, for our electricity, for our travel, for our healthcare, we need you know, we need the human eyes in there as well. And we need the investment in that. That investment, it's almost like you need to make a law that the the verification, the checks and balances that exist or should exist um, in these systems is required by law. And so you can't just cut back because you're putting everything at risk. And the only other thing I'd say is that I don't know. I'm glad in a way that this wake up call happened because maybe – people will take some sort of action to make sure it doesn't happen again. But that also doesn't usually work out that way. So it'll probably happen again. And maybe you're just having a good like process of how you roll out an update. Because I think one mm. thing that I saw that potentially was a bigger issue here compared to say other updates that have gone wrong is because it's a security update, you kind of need to get it out quickly to everyone. So it can't be it can't be abused. So rather than rolling out gradually and maybe seeing like, oh, one or two systems have had issues, we'll stop rolling it out. It's gone to everyone instantly. And so that's why then I think Microsoft have said it's about 8.5 million uh, Windows machines were effective, was their, was their estimate. Obviously, we're still only like a f- at the time of recording, only a few days into that. So maybe the number will go up or down. But yeah, that's mm. quite a lot of uh, Windows systems. And yeah, they're all hit with this update at once, which could have been part of the issue. So again... If it's legislating, if that happens, maybe putting in, you know, this is how updates should be sent out to machines so we don't have a big, big all at once outage. For sure. Am I right in thinking the uh, the fix has to be done manually? It's a file that has to be deleted. Is that something? They're, they're, they're working on, I think they're actually working on an automation for that right now. There's an update on CloudStrike today uh, that's that's that might automate the process and help people get back online more quickly. But yeah, I think up until the, that point, it has been manual, which is one of the reasons why it's taking so long to, to come back. It's quite a technical one because you've got to go into like the safe mode of your PC, find your drivers and delete like a very specific driver. Because again, yeah. if you're not technically minded and you delete the wrong one, you could make a bigger mess of it. <laughs> yeah. So it's, it's this very slow system of people trying to make sure that they they eliminate the the file they need to do and don't cause any more problems. Well, and with this being so corporate in general, you know, it's corporate that's hitting 
that's even more of a problem because most of the time, if it's anything like our company, you don't have the ability to do this by yourself either. If you're a remote worker, if you're doing hybrid working, any of these things, you now don't have that on-hand access to get into your device or potentially even tell someone that you don't have access to it to begin with, yeah. which is not the operational nightmare I'd ever want to be responsible for fixing, that's for sure. Um, well, that is... Unfortunately, about all the time we have for this episode. Uh, but before we sort of close off, Lance, you're often traveling about. Obviously, you had Paris last month. Uh, have you got any any travels coming up this month? Any exciting events you're heading towards? Well, we're, we're look, the next big event is Google's uh, big update, their right. big uh, pixel update, which is in August. And that's going to be like a lot of products. In fact, they've already started teasing the actual products. It'll be like the Google... Mm, nine fold pro i don't know why they keep <laughs> lengthening these names <laughs> but um there's going to be a lot of products there and so that's going to happen um and then uh, there'll be more god i'll be in berlin in in september for ifa and then of course you know what comes after that a little Christmas? fruit company out west <laughs> <laughs> um have you got any events in the next month any big news you think is going to come up uh, I'm uh, well, no, not really. I'm kind of hoping no big news comes up. You know, I like a quiet, quiet month. Hopefully, yeah. there'll be no more big outages. Yeah, there'll be nothing. I'm kind of excited for the the Pixel one. I'm a big Google Pixel fan, and so yeah, I kind of want to see what the Pixel Nine looks like. Be an interesting one, Matt. Yourself, got anything coming up? I've had so much news. I just want a week of no news. That's, there's, <laughs> I just love. A, Good I luck with in, that. At some time in the 1950s, the BBC broadcast there was no news today, and then soft jazz music for 10 minutes. And I'd love a day when that would happen great. again. <laughs> it's not going to happen. No. So I will say, like everybody else, um, I'm looking forward to the Pixel event. I'm wondering, uh, like you know, there are rumblings of a Pixel Watch Three, uh, which is you know gearing up towards an annual release. Uh, and of course, after that, we've got September, where we've already spoken about in other podcasts and across Tech Radar at the Apple Watch Series 10 and whatever else is coming. Yeah. So yeah, there's plenty to do on the horizon. Yeah. And I'm sure there'll be plenty of rumors to keep us busy in the next few weeks as well ahead of those Apple events. So it's going to be an exciting couple of weeks. For those who are watching, make sure to subscribe and keep up with all the latest news that we're going to be covering in next month's episode. Also make sure to watch out for our full Galaxy Watch Ultra, Galaxy Ring, Flip 6, and Fold 6 reviews coming to the YouTube channel soon. And I'm amazed that with that many useless words crammed together with numbers, I managed to remember any of them. Uh, thanks so much for watching, everyone, and we'll see you next time. Bye. 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 Bye.